In December of 2019, the feds launched Operation Throwdown, which targeted one of the country's oldest and most well-known Latino street organizations. The man that authorities say was in charge of all these coast operations for the organization, street name King Merlin, is not even Latino. Michael Ciccatelli, who is Italian, also has deep family ties to the Genovese crew that has controlled the native city of Springfield, Mass. for generations. Let's briefly explore this unique situation in the case involved. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. It's been such a long time. I missed you guys. So back in December of 2019, the feds launched Operation Throne Down, which was aimed at taking down the East Coast leadership of one of the nation's most well-known and infamous Latino street organizations. The investigations and arrests targeted the organization in numerous East Coast cities in Massachusetts and beyond. Authorities alleged that the organization was involved in numerous criminal conspiracies along with brazen acts of violence. Many high-ranking members of the organization were caught up in the case, but the big prize for law enforcement was the alleged over seer of the entire East Coast operation, Michael Ciccatelli, a.k.a. King Merlin. The organization has opened up to outside groups, but traditionally in the vast majority of its members are Latino. Michael Ciccatelli, a.k.a. King Merlin, is not Latino. He is very much Italian. He grew up in the now majority Hispanic city of Springfield, Massachusetts, and has had close ties to many fellow King members since childhood. Not only is this incredibly interesting and unique for such a high-ranking member of the organization to be Italian instead of Latino, but Ciccatelli also has close family ties to the Genovese crew that has run Springfield Mass for decades. I remember reading about this story when it first unfolded, and I thought it was incredibly interesting just simply for the fact that it was an Italian dude from Springfield in charge of the whole East Coast operation. Now after starting my channel and learning more about Springfield and the Genovese crew there, the story continues to intrigue me. So if you weren't aware, King Merlin's uncle is a man named David Chicky Ciccatelli. Chicky was an associate of the Genovese crew in Springfield, and he was also close friends with Anthony Arialata, and apparently he was one of the more successful bookies in the area during the late 90s and early 2000s. If you watch any mob tube channels and you're well aware of who Chicky is, and of late he's been getting more exposure on the internet. That guy who's part of Andrew Schultz's podcast, I think his show's called like Camp Gagnon or whatever, but he interviewed him and it's got like a million and a half views. I see some negative stuff out there about Chicky too, but hey, it's the internet, there's good and bad out there about everybody. Since early on in my channel, Chicky's always been commented and been really nice and supportive, so you won't hear me say anything negative about him. But Chicky is Michael King Merlin Chickatelli's uncle, and apparently they were sharing an apartment in Springfield when this unfolded, and Chicky got wrapped up in Operation Throwdown as a result. I'm not talking bad about Chicky if he's out there watching. What's up, Chicky? Uh, you know, he just got wrapped up in part of the Operation Thrown Down because he was sharing an apartment with his nephew, Michael Ciccatelli. And there was a weapon that got found, and apparently it was in his room that uh, that he was inhabiting. So he got wrapped up as part of it. And like I said, he's just a, a, he's becoming a pretty big internet personality on these mob tube shows. So if he's out there watching, what's up, Chicky? Uh, go check out that interview that I talked about. And apparently he's gotten a couple of small movie roles as well. But uh, like I said, he's always supported my channel, so I got nothing bad to say to him. I just want to say I did like a little series of videos last year about the mob in Springfield and the history of the Genovese crew there. Springfield, Massachusetts is the third largest city in the state, and it sits in the western part of Mass, right above the Connecticut border. Since Ray and Patriarca was the dawn, the Connecticut River has been the border between the New England Borgata and the New York Five families. Springfield has always been in the New York sphere of influence, and the Genovese family has had a tight grip on the city's rackets for the majority of the 20th century. But this city has always been run by its own. They just pay homage to New York instead of Boston and Providence. First, it was Big Nose Sam Kafari, then it was Skyball Scabelli, and finally the last real boss of Springfield was Big Al Bruno. The majority of the Italians in Springfield are from two villages in southern Italy, just like everyone in Gloucester is from the same village, Terracini, Sicily. 
but the city has had a long, solid LCN tradition. The boss of the city was recognized as a capo in the Genovese family with his own crew, but they weren't officially their own family. When Big Al was double-crossed by his trusted underling Anthony Ariolata and set up to be killed, the city's underworld would never be the same again. Anthony Ariolata was very ambitious and he didn't want to wait his turn to control the city's rackets. Along with acting Genovese family boss Adi Negro from the Bronx, Ariolata planned to take out the beloved boss of Springfield, Big Al Bruno. Adi Negro, along with later exposed FBI cooperator Joan Bologna, were putting squeeze on Springfield hard. They saw how much money Big Al and his crew were generating from illegal gambling and they wanted their share and more. The relations between New York and Springfield were already straining when Ariolata secretly met up with Negro and planned to take out his trusted mentor. For the job, Ariolata asked his friends, the Fair Gius brothers, Freddie and Ty, for help in doing the deed. The two men who are more than capable themselves, Freddie is responsible for Whitey's final scene in prison, but they themselves farmed the job out to a local hood they deemed a crash test dummy, Frankie Roche. In November of 2003, Roche managed to pull it off and Big Al met his demise, exiting the Mount Carmel Social Club in Springfield after his weekly game of Pinochle. Anthony Ariolata would go on later to cooperate against basically everybody involved in the crime. So after Big Al got whacked and Ariolata flipped on everyone, the power balance in Springfield's underworld shifted. With infighting and pressure from law enforcement, the mob was losing its grip on the Springfield streets. Throughout the 1990s, the demographics of the city were changing fast and more and more Latinos were moving into the city. Springfield and Holyoke are some of the first Massachusetts cities to see large Hispanic populations. Many of the state's first Latinos came to the Connecticut River Valley to work as migrant workers in the region's many farms. With work being mostly seasonal, many of the migrants found themselves moving into industrial centers like Springfield and Holyoke and further east to Worcester, Lowell, and Lawrence. By the 1990s, a lot of Latino groups that were initially created to protect the newcomers had morphed into criminal organizations. Now with the power of the LCN and Springfield greatly diminished, these Latino and other minority groups became a force on the city's streets. One of the biggest emerging powers in the city is also one of the most notorious organizations in the entire country. The Latin Kings. The Latin Kings are one of the most well-known street organizations in the country, if not the entire world. Originated in the Midwest city of Chicago in the 1960s, the Kings have spread to almost every state in the United States. The majority of these street organizations and the culture connected to them began in two cities, Los Angeles and Chicago. One created blue and red, and the other created the GDs, the VLs, and the Kings. Through the prison system and now more recently the internet and social media, this culture has spread from dangerous inner city neighborhoods to almost every part of the world. Now there are so many sets and variations over generations, it's nearly impossible to keep track of them all. But the Kings are one of the originals, and forgive the pun, but they are royalty among street organizations. After spreading to New York City in the 1990s, it first moved throughout Rikers Island and then the state prison system, originally to protect Latino inmates. As members got out of jail, they brought the message to the streets and began recruiting. The Kings quickly became a criminal organization on the street and spread throughout the Northeast region, where there are many cities with large Latino populations. So the Kings have been in Massachusetts since at least the mid-1990s, most likely earlier. The city of Lawrence, Mass. has very close connections in New York City, primarily the Bronx and Washington Heights neighborhoods. I know the Kings got an early foothold there, most likely because of some family connection to New York City. I'm actually curious to find out what city in Massachusetts had the first Kings. I know the first time I went to jail, the Kings and the Latin GDs from Lawrence were the two biggest street organizations operating in Middleton Jail. The Inyetas, which are a Puerto Rican prison organization, ran the actual facility, but nobody really messed with the Kings and the GDs because even in 2001, they were pretty deep. The whole time I was there, the two groups were at odds with each other, and there was a lot of tension between them. Over the last few decades, the Kings have built power bases in other Massachusetts cities besides Springfield and Lawrence, like Worcester, Lowell, Fitchburg, Chelsea, Lynn, Salem, Peabody. There's also a couple sets in the city of Boston, Morton Street, and D5K. Just look at the guy who was the dean at Boston English High School. He got sentenced to 18 years in prison. While Sean Harrison, a.k.a. King Rev, worked as the dean of Boston English High, one of his top responsibilities was to work with at-risk teenagers. He was supposed to be a mentor, someone to guide troubled adolescents in a positive way. King Rev instead used this as a recruiting opportunity. The same group of troubled youths were the perfect talent pool for a street organization like the Latin Kings. Two of his former students and protégés become the first in charge, a.k.a. Inca, and second in charge of the D5K set of Kings in Boston. 
Not only was King Rev violently the trust he'd been giving by directing his kids into a life of crime instead of college, but he was also supplying affiliated students with Mary Jane to peddle while they were in school. According to the authorities, King Rev would break everything up, package it correctly, bring it to school, give it to one of his trusted students, who would in turn go sell it to their classmates. Then, of course, they would return the proceeds to King Rev, keep their cut, and get a re-up. It's almost too crazy a story to believe if it weren't unfortunately true. So honestly, like the King Rev section of Operation Throne Down, I'm not gonna go into like too crazy detail in because it honestly deserves its own episode at the very least. Like a professional Hollywood writer couldn't come up with a better idea for a plot, in my opinion. Like this guy was the dean of students. He was supposed to be like guiding troubled youth away from the troubles of the street and stuff like that. Instead, he's getting them involved directly in the lifestyle. He's supplying them with illicit goods to sell while they're in school. And the whole story climaxed with him thinking that one of his underlings was going to turn on him and give up the whole operation. And he told him to meet him and he tried to take him out. Luckily, the kid survived. He like blasted him um, in the back of the head. The kid survived and the, it was all caught on surveillance tape. Like you, you can't, you cannot make this stuff up. It's like sometimes uh, truth is stranger than fiction. The kings of another stronghold down on the Massachusetts South Coast in the city of New Bedford. New Bedford or New Beige and nearby Fall River have always been known as Portuguese territory, even up until current times. But there's also sizable Latino populations in the South Shore cities. Both cities have built unfortunate reputations for violence and narcotics over the years. New Bedford, for whatever reason, has become a power base for the Kings in the South Coast area. The Kings of New Bedford were one of the deepest sets in Massachusetts and they have been incredibly active as well. 22 out of the total 62 people indicted in Operation Thrown Down were from the New Bedford Latin Kings set. New Bedford authorities claim that the Kings operated three main trap houses in the city on Tallman Street, North Front Street, and Sawyer Street. Residents complained about traffic 24-7 coming for people trying to get their fix. While the organization ran other spots in the city, these three locations were their main distribution points. The Kings in New Bedford tend to have the strongest presence in the North End neighborhood of the city, and that's where these trap houses were located. I've read that the Kings had some sort of agreement worked out with the landlord of these properties. After the police raided one of the apartments, the Kings had set up shop and the landlord claimed he evicted the tenants. When in reality, the landlord just moved them to a different apartment in the building and switched the name on the lease to the King's girlfriend's name. There were also at least three prominent female members of the New Bedford Kings chapter. The Kings have historically been one of the most open street organizations when it comes to females. Latin queens can be just as active as their male counterparts when it comes to dealing or committing acts of violence. A lot of street organizations have female and lesser roles and not as full-fledged members. The almighty Latin Kings and Queens nation has been kind of unique in this regard. It wasn't just the dealing and the foot traffic to their spots all day and night. Like most cases, when the violence starts happening, the authorities get involved. The Kings and New Bedford main rivals were the GDs, just like in Lawrence in the early 2000s when I first went to jail. The GDs are part of the Folk Nation and rock the Six-Pointed Star, while the Kings are on the opposite side of the spectrum and are part of the People's Nation and rock a Five-Pointed Star. It really goes all the way back to Chicago and the different Latino factions that were battling against each other for territory. In New Bedford, it was similar where the two groups were natural enemies, but New Bedford authorities claimed that there were also vicious acts of violence between fellow Kings. The Latin Kings are one of the oldest and most structured street organizations in the country, and they have many rules which they happen to strictly enforce. One New Bedford King member was caught having an affair with another King's woman. The Kings met, decided to violate him, which means to punish him. For that particular infraction, the sentence was termination, and unfortunately for him, that's exactly what happened. He got terminated. The residents of New Bedford were starting to wonder what was going on. It seemed like the Kings were operating with impunity in their city. Sometimes local police have their hands tied, all they can do is make arrests, once it's in the courts it's out of their control. That's why a lot of times the feds will step in and make these big RICO cases. The feds have resources that individual cities can't even imagine. They can also group sets of an organization from cities and states together into a wider conspiracy that local police can't do. That's exactly what happened in Operation Throne Down. The feds stepped in and started working with individual police departments that had been investigating the kings in their cities. One federal prosecutor also announced that by making these cases federal, the criminals would receive lengthy federal sentences instead of what he called a slap on the wrist, which is what he said they receive at the county and state level. In theory, it sounds good, but is it really the case? Sure, the federal government has more resources, but they also have a reputation for making bogus deals with criminals. Michael Ciccatelli, a.k.a. King Merlin, has been a prominent member of the Kings in Springfield for decades now. 
He was caught up in a similar federal case in 2005 where he was sentenced to four years in federal prison. Apparently, while in the feds, he made a good impression on the organization's hierarchy. The Kings have a strong presence in all levels of correctional facilities in the United States. The Massachusetts Department of Corrections names the Kings as the largest street organization operating in the state's facilities. They have a presence in almost every county jail in the state from the North Shore to the South Coast, the Merrimack Valley, and the far west reaches of Massachusetts. Apparently, King Merlin was the Inca, or leader of the Springfield chapter, when he went away in 2005. While in the feds, he became the top king in all of Massachusetts. I'm not sure if other top-ranking members in the feds were impressed by Merlin's LCN contacts. Perhaps they liked having a possible link to Italian organized crime. LCN is basically considered royalty of the underworld. After Chicatelli's brief four-year sentence, he was released back to Springfield, where he would now operate as the overseer of the entire East Coast operation. Michael Ciccatelli's situation was quite unique. He grew up in the shadow of the Italian mob, watching his uncle make money as a bookmaker, seeing how the LCN operated and conducted their business. But Ciccatelli grew up in a different generation, and most of his friends growing up were Latino. King Merlin was known to be a ruthless and efficient leader for the kings. He stressed the rules of the organization. If a member violated any, they would be severely punished. Apparently, King Merlin was holding secret meetings with other members of the kings at the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Social Club. This is the same club that was the center of Springfield's Italian-American community. It was also the spot where Big Al Bruno met his demise. The fact that he was meeting with fellow kings at the former LCN hut spot did not sit well with many residents. Longtime mayor Dominic Sano, my buddy's first cousin also, closed the social club down temporarily after this and other unsavory things that were uncovered happening at the historic site. The feds allege that under King Merlin's rule, the kings continued to build their street empire, making millions of illicit dollars and trafficking conspiracies. They dabbled in a little bit of everything, but green and white were their main money makers. King Merlin is also alleged to have ordered beatings and even death to rivals and members alike. He's recorded on tape by a confidential informant ordering a violation against a member for taking pictures with a rival on social media. King Merlin was someone who had given the majority of his life to the organization and seemed to really believe in its rules and principles. That's why it's confusing to a lot of people what happened to King Merlin after Operation Throwdown. This would be his second federal conviction, so one would think that the penalty would be more severe than his first sentence. Plus, with the seriousness of the charges against him, he was looking at 20 years in the feds at the very least. But then in 2022, a strange twist of events happened. Michael King Merlin Ciccatelli was sentenced to four years in a secret closed-door court proceeding. Originally, from the way the newspapers were reporting it, it seemed like Chicatelli was going to take a structured plea agreement and get around 20 years. Then between 2021 and 2022, something happened. Michael's uncle, former Genovese associate Chicky Chicatelli, said he and other family members lost contact with King Merlin. His uncle Chicky ended up getting arrested as part of the raids in Operation Throwdown. Michael and Chicky were sharing an apartment in Springfield when the feds raided it, finding a weapon in Chicky's room. He pleaded out and served a couple months getting probation and having to wear an ankle bracelet. Chicky had absolutely nothing to do with the Kings besides the fact that Michael was his nephew and they lived together. A lot of people wonder about how lucrative the Kings operation really was if King Merlin had to share an apartment with his uncle and sleep on a mattress on the floor. But Chicky says that in the months leading up to the surprise sentencing, no one in the family had heard from King Merlin. These things are red flags that someone has flipped and is cooperating with law enforcement. Now, there's no physical evidence saying that King Merlin flipped or cooperated with the authorities, but it's extremely suspect. Anyone who has experience in the legal system knows that a closed-door court proceeding where the public or press is not allowed is a giant red flag. If someone wasn't actually cooperating, they would most likely refuse to a closed-door court appearance because of what it represents. Not only was Michael Ciccatelli sentenced in closed, but he was hit with the same four-year sentence he received for his first federal conviction. It's kind of confusing when a federal prosecutor says that they want to make the case federal so the defendant doesn't just get another slap on the wrist at the local level, just to simply get another slap on the wrist at the federal level. King Merlin admitted to being the number one king on the entire East Coast. While in that position, he oversaw a vast distribution network and directly ordered acts of violence, some even resulting in death. Those are serious charges regardless of the fact that he had already been convicted at the federal level previously for similar crimes. I've read blogs online titled King Merlin Flips or King Merlin Flipped, which again seems like the most plausible explanation for the events that have unfolded, but I can't find any actual hard evidence. There was a rumor while investigations were unfolding that a high-ranking East Coast king was cooperating with the feds to help execute Operation Throwdown. Some people are wondering if King Merlin could have possibly been cooperating with the feds before his arrest, and that's why he received such a short sentence. 
Either way, if the feds did in fact make a deal, it's not surprising. But I'll never morally agree with the decision to make the boss a cooperator in order to convict all the underlings. Or when feds make deals with horrific criminals just to get a political or personal enemy. I wish I had an answer to give you guys as a resolution. You can draw your own conclusions. I would say that the evidence strongly points in the direction of King Merlin making a deal. He's probably getting out soon if he's not already out. I wonder if he's going to relocate or if he'll stay in the Springfield area. Anthony Ariolotta did. This was just the latest attack against the King's organization. Every decade or so, the authorities launch a major operation against them. They can continue to do raids like this till the end of time. It's not going to stop the problem. There's always another generation that will come after and take their place. The Kings are one of the countries in Massachusetts' oldest and most infamous Latino street organizations in history, and they're not about to go anywhere now. Maybe if leaders spent a little more time and resources on the youth before they get into the streets, things would look a little bit different. As for Springfield, King Merlin's home city, Operation Throne Down did little to help the citizens' quality of life. Without the old god of the city's Genovese crew and even King Merlin and his OG kings, the Springfield streets have turned into complete chaos. There is more crime and narcotics in the city than ever, and last year the city broke a very macabre milestone. Springfield recorded the highest amount of bodies ever on record. They had almost as half as many bodies as Boston, which is almost five times bigger in size than Springfield. In my personal opinion, it's just a minor setback for the Kings. Their organization has been around for almost 70 years. They're strong on the streets and in the correctional facilities. The Kings aren't some passing fad. At this point, you have multi-generations of families joining the same street organizations. It's almost like a family birthright. It goes the same for certain cities and neighborhoods. If a kid lives in an area controlled by a certain group, then he'll most likely join up with them, especially if he's being harassed by a rival group just for where he lives. It seems to me that the culture and popularity of these street organizations are at an all-time high now. I can remember as a young adolescent in the 1990s when it was first starting to come out into the mainstream of music and movies, but now it's thoroughly entrenched in our country's identity. Through the internet and social media, it's spread to every corner of the world as well. People see the American street and prison culture and want to emulate it. A lot of shows romance it and glamorize it, but the exact opposite. It's a dead-end life of suffering and misery. Don't get involved, kids. So of course the Hollywood version of the story would have been Michael Ciccatelli was raised by the mob, taught all the rackets, then became a Latin king. He then used all his LCN connections, linked the two organizations together, and became this big East Coast kingpin. It does sound good, but that's not the case. Did the fact that King Merlin had family connections with the Genovese through his uncle have any effect on how the kings viewed him? Yeah, most likely. By the time King Merlin came out of federal prison the first time in 2009, the mob in Springfield was pretty much decimated. Still to this day, there's some LCN action in Springfield, but it's never been the same since Big Al got clipped. So I don't think there was ever any criminal conspiracies that transpired between the Kings and the Springfield LCN after Merlin's release. Merlin just seems like the kind of cunning manipulator, and he probably liked the aura of people thinking that he had the LCN at his disposal, possibly. One way or another, Michael Ciccatelli worked his way up to the top spot of the King's organization of the entire East Coast. He got there by directing others to commit violence on his behalf and intimidating anyone who got in his way. So in August of 2022, Michael King Merlin Ciccatelli received what federal prosecutors assured the public he was not going to get, which was a slap on the wrist. He was on recorded audio ordering beatings of people and even the death of a man. Add that on to the fact that he is the documented overseer of the entire East Coast Kings operation, then how is it possible that he only received a four-year sentence? I guess no one will ever really know, unless King Merlin decides to speak on it because the court proceedings were completely private. There's no record of it anywhere online that I can find. Only that it happened and he pled guilty and was sentenced to four years. That's the only info out there. His uncle Chicky doesn't seem to know anything about what's going on with him. The truth usually always comes out in the end. In the meantime, the kings in the Bay State will continue to recruit on the streets and in the Commonwealth's correctional facilities. They're one of the first Latino organizations in Massachusetts, and they're not leaving anytime soon, it would seem. So I just want to thank you guys so much for all the overwhelming support in the last couple weeks with all this crazy stuff that was going on with YouTube trying to demonetize my channel. You guys really showed up for me, and I really believe we're building one of the best communities here on YouTube. This channel is really amazing. You guys are like the best subscribers, best viewers. That really meant a lot, guys. You guys really showed up for me. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. If you like this video, hit the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. But you guys know the most important thing. Make good decisions. Make good choices. Take good care of yourself, your family, your friends, your fellow human beings. Try to have a nice day, guys. I'll talk to you soon. God bless.